Hey guys, it's lesson 26. I, uh, I'm not feeling super great today, so this is going to be quick. And uh, excuse me if I don't sound super enthusiastic. I'm just uh, struggling with some health things. So what are you going to do? Um, anyway, let's, uh, let's move ahead. What I want to do this week is have you guys work through um, some board work where we actually calculate real values using an ion trap computer. Uh, a hypothetical ion trap computer. So let's say there are two calcium ions confined to the z-axis of an ion trap. I want you to presume that the, the confinement is very strong so that the uh, oscillations transverse to the z-axis in the x and y directions um, are going to be in the ground state. And so we've cooled the thing down. Uh, just imagine that. Obviously that's a technical issue. You have to actually cool the thing down. But the guys are cooled down, and then just classically, I'd like you to work out, uh, given that the potential along the z direction is a quadratic potential, I'd like you to try to figure out what the equilibrium spacing between the two ions is going to be. These are calcium ions, singly ionized. And, uh, and then work out, any way you can, what the frequency of the center of mass mode of oscillation is. This is when both ions always move in the same direction. So they're both moving to the right or they're both moving to the left. That's the center of mass mode. And then while you're at that, you might as well go ahead and work out the frequency of the breathing mode. That's the mode where um, one ion moves to the right, but the other ion moves to the left. That's another mode of a two ion chain. And uh, see what the frequency difference is between those two modes. That's going to turn out to be important later. But uh, uh, interestingly, the frequency difference between the two lowest modes, uh, or the frequency of the two lowest modes is related by um, the same basic relationship independent of the number of ions. So it's kind of an interesting result. Um, and we may have time to work that out. But anyway, the, it's easiest to work out for two ions. Of course, if you add more ions, it gets more complicated. It's not terrible, but it, um, that's what we're going to do. So um, let's talk about cooling. Imagine that we're using the S1 half P3 halves transition for cooling. That's a dipole allowed transition. I'd like you to work out the recoil limit of the temperature. What is the lowest temperature you can reach using that transition? Um, and uh, that'll be enlightening, I think. And then also, assuming that the, uh, the number of spontaneous photon emissions per second at the laser frequency is 10 to the sixth, um, I'd like you to work out what the f equilibrium displacement of the ion is from its uh, from the z-axis. Remember that the radiation pressure from the laser beam is going to displace the ion from its equilibrium position if, when the laser's off. And I'd like to have you estimate um, how far that is. And finally, uh, for the same system, I'd like you to calculate how long it takes for the ion's motion to cool down in the direction perpendicular, parallel to the laser beam. And uh, that'll give you some order magnitude sense of how long these things actually take to occur. Finally, let's look at computing itself. Remember that the level structure for calcium ions looks something like this, that levels that we're interested in. And uh, remember that the U transition, or the U operator, uh, has the following effect on the various uh, states. We've got ion A, ion B, and then the bus or uh, harmonic oscillator motion, center of mass motion of the two ions together, the, the so-called quantum bus. Um, I'd like you to compute the wavelength that would be needed to achieve the U transition. We're looking at the trans what you have to accomplish, what wavelength would you need to use to actually do that? And given that we know that the, the uh, quadrupole transition from D to S, the D5 halves to the S1 half, has a lifetime of something on the order of a second. So that turns out to relate to the width of the transition, the width of that resonance. Is there very much danger of exciting the N equals 2 mode or the breathing mode of the oscillator of the comp of the uh, translational motion of the ions in the uh, in the cavity 
And uh, so that's enough questions. I, I don't think we'll probably even get through all of them tomorrow. But uh, that gives you a sense of the kinds of questions I want you to think about and the things I want you to be able to do both on the homework and on the, on the exam. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about how to write code that runs on the cluster because we're getting around the time when we need to start doing that. How do we take advantage of more compute nodes? And uh, how do we just think about calculating things on a cluster of computers? So I've got a little demo here we can watch and then that'll be all for today. See you next time. Okay, guys, so this is a calculation we did back in Computing Project 2. Uh, <clears throat> if you remember, we're calculating the integral of uh, e to the minus lambda times dx. And uh, I went ahead and worked out the exact integral here. This is from 0 to infinity. Uh, and the exact result is 1 over lambda squared. But the strategy was to use a Monte Carlo approach, where we generated a bunch of random numbers in an exponential distribution and then computed the expectation value of x using that uh, using x's that are distributed exponentially. So that was kind of a trick to calculate an integral. Um, the reason I'm interested in that kind of calculation is because it turns out to be fairly easy to use a cluster computing system in order to calculate things using that basic approach. So here's the idea. Here's the calculation. You generate n random numbers you convert those uniformly distributed random numbers into an exponential distribution with the logarithm function, as we discussed before. And then you calculate the uh, expectation value of x divided by lambda. So x dot sum over n is the expectation value of x. And you divide by lambda in order to convert this into a, what you call, uh, normalized distribution. That's kind of the idea. And uh, what you get back is the answer. So let's go ahead and run this. I'll just choose run here. <coughs> and we'll see what we get. And there's the answer. The Monte Carlo result was 0 0.2506 and change. <coughs> the exact result is 0.25. Of course, we know I only took like 50,000 samples, I think 50,000 samples. And so we didn't get a very precise result, but it was pretty close. Now the idea is, how do I run this on a cluster computer? So I've cooked up this module called Handy MPI. So I'm going to bring a new window into the frame. And the Handy MPI is a, is a uh, Python module that I'll give you guys to use. It has really a several important functions. But today, we're only interested in this one called ForEach. So I'm importing two things from MPI. I'm importing the ForEach function, and I'm importing the MyRank constant. <coughs> My rank basically is a way to check each each processor can check to see what its name is or what its index is in the list of cluster computer nodes. The node that's in charge of everybody else by default we're going to use is the zero node. So down here you'll notice I'm checking if my rank is zero then I'm going to print something out. <coughs> it turns out the zero node is special. It's called the master node and it's in charge of coordinating the calculation with the other nodes. But notice everything is the same here with the exception that we don't call the docalc method directly. Um, actually, what I want to do is make n equal to 10,000. <coughs> 10 is going to be equal, n is going to be equal to 10,000. And then I'm going to multiply here the list that contains only one thing, n, by nodes. And here I have, let's make it five nodes making changes here. Uh, let me just show you what that does. If you're not familiar with m list multiplication in Python, if I, uh, if I make a list with a 3 in it, so let's call x equal to 3, and if I say print x, I have a list with a 3 in it, then what happens when I multiply that by a number like 5? It makes a new list, but now it's uh, el a list with 5 elements, uh, where each element is the same value essentially. So that's kind of a neat trick and it's useful because what I want to do here, I'll tell you the way for each works. You pass in a function and you pass in a list of arguments and what it does is to compute the function using each one of the values in the argument. So in other words if I pass in uh, a list with five ten thousands in it, it's going to call do calc with ten thousand once and put the result in a list. Then it's going to call do calc with 10,000 again and put the result of that calculation in, a in the same list. And it'll do that for until it runs out of, 
uh, list. And when it runs out of list, it'll have nodes results. Each result will have come from one of these uh, arguments. So it it uh, it computes the do calc function n times. However, well, I should say uh, in this case nodes times, and uh, and puts the results in a list. Now notice down here when I get to the bottom, I check to see if I'm the master node, and if I am. I make an array out of the results, I add them up, and I divide by the length of the results array. So I'm taking the average of these different results that came back from the different invocations of DoCalc. And uh, I'm also going to print out the exact here. I'll make this. <coughs> Tell you what, let's do it this way. Um, so the point is, uh, it, calc it calls DoCalc, in this case, five times. But um, on a cluster computer, it's smart enough to know. It goes out and sort of sniffs around and says, hey, I'm running on a cluster computer. And what it does is to distribute the calculation, the calling of DoCalc, on the different nodes. So each node is going to get one invocation of DoCalc, and the results are going to accumulate in uh, an array that gets passed back in results. But but for each takes care of all the coordination with the different nodes and making sure everybody's doing the right thing and so on. So um, let's go ahead. Now, here's the thing. If you run this on a system that doesn't have a cluster environment, <clears throat> what it does is it just cal calls, calls do calc nodes times one after the other and accumulates the results in a list. The beauty of that is that I can write my code on my laptop or any other computer, that whether it has a cluster environment or not, and test it to make sure that it's working correctly. And then when I take the same program and move it to a real cluster with real nodes, it'll do the right thing and pass the computation out. And my homework for this section is for you guys to write any kind of program you like to calculate just about anything you like. But I want you to use this for each method and demonstrate that your code runs faster on a cluster than it does on a single processor or in a, in a single process on a, on a conventional computer. So let's go ahead and run it. If I just run it in this window, it doesn't find an MPI environment, and it comes back with a result. But uh, it's nothing very dramatic. <clears throat> if I were to run the same code on a cluster, it would uh, it would be faster. Of course, it doesn't always mean it's faster. It depends on the nature of the calculation and how much overhead there is in getting the thing going. And it is quite easy to write programs that run slow, more slowly on a cluster than they do on a conventional computer. And that's part of the business of learning how these things work and figuring out what works and what doesn't and so on. All right.